Hi, I have to apologize. I forgot to turn the camera on this morning. So what I'm going to do, because I don't want you to miss a chance to stay at, keep up, I am going to redo the lesson. You're, of course, going to miss out on all the brilliant um, discussion that we had in class, but I will try to do a better job of keeping up. And um, I'll get someone to remind me to turn the camera on in the future. Anyway, we're picking up in Exodus 21, verse 7. And verse 7 through 11 says, and I'm going to be looking down at my notes a lot. So it starts off. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then she shall be redeemed. He shall not have... He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her with a daughter, as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. So slave here really means a slave wife, or in other words, a concubine, like, like Hagar. So this is a case of a father selling his daughter for a secondary marriage, not a first wife. Um, so her, this is a permanent position. She does not get to go out in six years. Um, now, this isn't the only way daughters were sold. Sometimes they were sold as indentured servants, so they would be um, free at the end of six years. But this is one that is meant to become the concubine of either the father or the son. Um, so, if they, you know, one of the advantages is that she went to them fairly young, they would end up raising her. And they would raise her. She'd be used to the household. So, let's say years later. Time for her to be wed. Um, again, as a secondary wife. So, say, they say, no, we didn't, she's not working out. They couldn't just kick her out. So, if she was to be the concubine of the father, he was to... Keep giving her a home, keep feeding her, that kind of stuff. Um, and as a note, it could be any reason. He didn't have to give a reason. He just was displeased with her for some reason. Um, and, but if he doesn't marry her, it's a, considered a breach of contract. And he's still obligated to respect her rights. He had to treat her well and not deprive her of anything. She was to be as a wife without... The marriage part of it. But if someone else wanted to redeem her, to say, well, I will take her. And most often this was the family, but it didn't have to be. They could pay that redemption price and they could have her. He couldn't sell her to a foreign nation. That was strictly forbidden. So, okay, that's if the father was going to marry her. Now, if it's a son, she was to be treated as a full daughter-in-law for the rest of her life, not a slave. If, he, if the father or the son took a secondary wife, she still had to be treated fairly and be given her food and clothing and things like that. If they decide, nope, they just don't want her in the house at all, she is free. She doesn't have to pay anything. We in the Western world have a hard time understanding arranged marriages. But for them, it was all they knew. Everyone around them, it was all they knew. What made it different for them is that they, God's law protected these females. Where other nations around, they would just kick them out without a second thought so God is providing it shows God really cares 
He cares about women as much as he cares about men. Then verse 12 through 14. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place that he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So this is capital punishment. And the idea of capital punishment actually goes back to Genesis 9. And the right for the state to execute, we see in Romans 13, 3 through 4. So the government has the right to execute people. Now, the next few laws are going to seem really harsh, but God brought them so that they would diminish blood feuds. If, if they, he didn't have these kind of laws, people would be out for revenge all the time. So, when these kind of cases came before judges, judges were to look for evidence of premeditation and treachery. Accidents, crimes of passion, they were on a different level. But if it was a premeditated murder, the murderer was to die. There were no exceptions. Um... Now, if it was an accidental murder, the family of the one killed was obligated to go seek revenge from the person that did the killing. They were to go kill mm -hmm. that person. Uh, and the person that was sent to go kill the murderer, he was called a Goel Hadam or a redeemer of blood. We see Goels in other places of the Bible. Um, we see in Ruth that her future husband, he is a Goel who, say, who redeems her. Um, Jesus is our Goel. He redeemed us. So what's this thing about the horns and the altar, taking them from the altar? Um, in Numbers 35, we're going to see Joshua get a command. Um, well, Numbers 35 and Joshua 20. God is commanding that cities be built called um, City of Refuge. And they're going to be sprinkled throughout Israel. There will end up being six of them. Anyone who committed manslaughter could run there and be protected. If they made it within those city gates, they could be protected from that Goel Hadam. Um, and he'd be safe. Now, if he was a murderer, God says, drag him from that altar. He is not allowed to seek refuge in the city of refuge. Of course, the one running, the one that committed manslaughter, if he didn't reach that city gate before the Goel Hadam got to him, he'd be killed. But once he reached city gates, safety. Um, so again, the, there were six of these cities in Israel once we get past the wilderness wanderings. So everyone was in one day's run of one of these cities. Um, so... In most cultures, there was a religious altar, and that was, and it would serve as a place of sacrifice or justice or sanctuary. So, what would happen? And in Israel, these um, we'll find out later. These altars had horns on them. Now, if it was an animal being sacrificed. He was tied to those horns. And it was um, a symbol that he belonged to God. So if a man was seeking refuge, he would go grab those horns, meaning he was dedicating his life to God and seeking safety. God says, so, though, if it's a murderer, take his hands off that altar, take him out and kill him. He does not have the right to seek refuge. Um, in Hebrews, God says, first de 
or not in Hebrews. God says that first degree murderers can't seek out um, refuge. Um, and in Numbers 35, 31 through 34, God's, God will be telling us that unpunished murderers defile the land. So they have to be um, punished. In Kings 2.29, we see that David's nephew Joab had killed two men, and he went running for a city of refuge and ran to the altar and grabbed it, and Solomon took him from the altar and put him to death. So there is a, a line between um, murder and manslaughter, um, different punishments. God has a clear line for that. Okay, verse 15, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. The word strike here means a vicious assault, basically an attempted murder. It's the opposite of the fifth commandment. In the fifth commandment, you're told, honor your father and mother and you will have a long life. While you dishonor your father and mother, you're going to have a short life. So the rabbis came along and they, of course, added to this and they decided that this referred to adult children who struck an aged parent with intent to injure. But you don't see anything in there saying adult children. So if a young teen were to strike his parent in a vicious way, they would be guilty. It shows an ungrateful attitude. Now the Code of Hammurabi, the code for the pagan people in, a, in another area, said to cut off the offender's hands. That not enough for God. God says they need to die. They are rebelling against their parents. They're rebelling against God. Verse 16 says, Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. So, our picture of slavery is that you kidnap someone and put and make them a slave. That's not the kind of slavery that we're talking about here. Kidnapping was considered a capital offense. Um, kidnapping for slavery in everywhere else around the world, that's what, how they got their slaves. But God says, no, he doesn't want slaves. In Israel, Hebrew people were slaves when they chose to be slaves. Now, we don't see anything about non-Hebrew people here yet. Um, other cultures only considered it a capital crime if you kidnapped the wrong person. Basically, someone in royalty. But anyone else you kidnapped, it wasn't considered a crime. But God values all life. Criminally in, enslaving a person is the same as murder to God. It's taking someone's life away. So mm -hmm. this law isn't placed with other laws about property because God isn't looking at people as property. They are human beings created in his own image and the Hebrews are his chosen people. Um, slavery as regulated in the Bible, it was a a chosen thing. We're going to see there are a lot of rules about slaves. So God loved those who had put themselves in a position to be slaves too. Verse 17 says, whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Um, this is another one not just directed at, at adult children. It meant younger children too. And it seems severe to put them to death. But respect for your parents and for the older generation, that was foundational for them. It's foundational for us. And, and look what kind of mess we are, we're in because it's not something we do. We don't respect our, our older generation. Back in um, when we talked about the fifth commandment, when it says honor your father and mother, the word for honor means um, mm -hmm. heavy. It means to give weight to, to um, 
honor because um, it's a sub substantive. It's, it's heavy for you. Where cursing means light or to treat lightly. So you're treating your parents lightly, not giving them the heavy respect they deserve. It also, um, the word lightly or the word curse here is in present tense, mean, meaning it's something that's occurring over and over and over again. It's a habitual, a habitual behavior for them. By cursing a parent, you're actually disowning them. Um, you're treating them with contempt and saying you wish they die type of thing. Older generations are at the mercy of younger generations. Um, if younger generations are allowed to um, wage open warfare on their senior generations, society is in a real mess. And the idea of a curse here is more of a death threat. It, it's, again, kind of like we talked about last week, and again, excuse the cussing, but it's like telling someone, God damn you. And is that really what you want to do? You want God to damn that person? Not that God will do it based on your words, but he, God knows your intent. So, um, parent, parents in the older generation were to be honored, not cursed. And again, it seems like such a harsh penalty, but it was a, considered an act of rebellion against God. So now we're getting to a different kind of law. These are the laws of retribution. Um, it's called Talion Law. Um, we see it as um, expressed as eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth law. We're going to see that doesn't mean quite what it sounds like, but it's a law, the laws of retribution. It, it basically, the punishment needs to fit the crime. So verse 18 and 19 say, When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and the man does not die but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoors with his staff, he who struck him shall be clear. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. Now we're going to go through these laws of retribution. I'm going to give a brief explanation and then... First thing next week, we are going to be talking about how these all tie together and the basics of the retribution. So this one is dealing with men that are fighting, but they're not intending to kill each other. So they're fighting. Um, one of them is injured and can't work. So the other one owes them their, um, well, has to pay for everything while he is recuperating. Now, the minute he can get up and walk even with a cane, then it starts, stops. So that's the basic of that one. Verse 20 and 21. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. So earlier slaves didn't seem like property, but now they seem like property. It, it's kind of confusing. Um, God always cares about the person. But these are people, again, that sold themselves, in mo almost all cases, they sold themselves into this indentured servanthood because they needed to survive. Now the ones that didn't sell themselves into it. It's, they became indentured servants because they stole something and couldn't pay it back, something like that. So why does God allow slaves to be beaten or to be struck? It's part of their social structure. Physical punishment was considered an appropriate response for acts of disobedience and rebellion. Um, but there was only so far that the masters were allowed to go. 
and it made sense for them only to go so far because these are people working for them. If you beat them to death, they can't work for you. Or if you make it where they can't work, you are lose, you as a master are losing out. So it's not something they wanted to do. Still, it wasn't okay to murder a slave. That slave would be avenged. And it doesn't say it here, but he'd be avenged by being killed. But it seemed to be okay to to hit them as long as they didn't die immediately within the first two days. If they die, if they live for two days, that meant that the slave owner didn't mean to kill them, even if they die day three. Um, and again, the master would have been losing um, a person that was working for him. And he would have it would be a loss for the master. So it's not something that they wanted to do. They figured a master doesn't want to kill a slave. And for their culture, for a master to be punished for anything to do with a slave, that was revolutionary. No other culture had that. So God is still showing care for people. So this paints kind of a picture behind the ideas of slavery or again, indentured servanthood in Israel. A servant was a person, yet they were considered property of the master until their obligation was fulfilled. And it's all tied to money. The owner has an investment in this slave. It's like um, my son-in-law. He is, um, he went to go work at this company in, in Kentucky. And then immediately he and his family have had all these illness things. After, right after my son-in-law completed all their training. Well, the company, you know, could just say, well, gosh, he's not working out. Let, let's let him go. But they invested a lot of time and money into training him. So they're, they're not anxious to let him go. Same idea here. Verses 22 through 25. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, Wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Okay, from verse 23, 24, and 25, that is the part that is called Italian law, eye for an eye. Um, but it doesn't really mean that if, if someone takes your eye out, you're going to take their mm -hmm. eye out. It's a little different for that. It's, again, the punishment has to fit the crime. So in this case, two men are fighting. And there's a pregnant woman nearby and she gets struck. No matter why she's there, um, she's, she's an innocent bystander and she's carrying a life. If it makes her have a baby, either through a miscarriage or just an early birth, but the baby is okay, the guy that hit her still has to pay something. He has to pay retribution. So, and the husband gets to decide how much. Now, you would think a husband would say, I want it all. You, everything this guy owns. But a judge has to approve it to keep it within um, reason. Even if it's accidental, the offender had to pay it. Because there's a, lot, a baby's life involved. And babies were so precious to them. It was an inexcusable idea and it meant you were so out of control if you hit a pregnant woman that it was just strictly not allowed. But if either the mother or the baby died, it was life for life. And in this case, that one is right. The, 
if a, if either of them died, then the person that hit the mother dies too. It shows just how much God treasures a fetus. Their culture treasured a fetus. You won't see a law in, in the Bible about aborting a baby because that was so unthinkable. That would have been horror behind, beyond horror to purposely kill your own baby. So we don't see that law because beyond their imagination. Verse 26 and 27. When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. So here's an example of the talium eye and how it actually worked. So we always seem to picture, okay, you knock the slave's eye out, your eye gets knocked out. No, the slave goes free. Same thing with the tooth. You don't go knocking the master's tooth out. The slave goes free. And that is really so much more precious than um, an eye, the eye or a tooth. Well, maybe not. That, that would have been pretty serious. But, um, and these laws, you don't see the law saying, and you shall love and adore your slave, or you shall love and adore your master. It's to make sure you're, they were guiding the behavior of the master, giving him an incentive to protect and honor his slave as a human being, treating them more like an employee than a, than a work animal. Um, so this is a, a long set of verses, verses 28 through 32. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owner had been warned but has not kept it in, and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner shall be put to death. If a ransom is imposed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. If it gores a man's son or daughter, he shall be dealt with according to the same rule. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So notice it purposely states man or woman, son or daughter, women were treated equally in these circumstances. So this is a law that's covering intent and neglect. They use the ox as an example because the ox was the most deadly of the domesticated animals and the most likely to kill someone. But it, the concept would apply to any animal. So if you had a, um, a killer pig, it would apply for your killer pig too. But it was most likely going to be an ox. And this is another example of one, one of the laws that, um, in, in the way it's worded, it doesn't really apply to us because I'm sure we all keep our ox under control. We don't let them go goring people, but it's the principle behind it. We are responsible for the things that belong to us. In, in our day, the closest thing we would think of is pit bulls. If you own a pit bull and they go attack a person, and you know they're dangerous, you're the one in trouble. But in this case, you'd be put to death. But it applies to anything that is ours. If we knowingly use our cars as a, as a weapon, same concept. We are to care um, and take care of our things and, and protect other people. Um, so, Losing an ox is really hardship on a, on a farmer, especially because they don't get any stakes out of it. They're not allowed to profit in any way or form from this ox that gores people. Um, now, the owner couldn't be held responsible if that ox 
didn't have a history of goring people or he had no idea that that ox couldn't live and he couldn't profit from it. Um, someone asked in class whether you could skin it and use it, use the leather. No, you could not profit in any way. That ox had to be destroyed. And you'll notice the ox had to be stoned because they figured if it's an ox that's going to gore people, the only safe way to do that is put the ox a ways off and stone it. Um, now, if the, if the owner knew the ox tended to be grouchy and go after people, um, and he didn't keep it contained, then the owner would be put to death. But there was a way out. Now, most of these, these this is kind of like the um, laws for the judges that they're going to be hearing all these cases. This, is, this gives them the specifics and some generalities on how to rule. Um, so in, they're given a little leeway. So suppose the bull had to had tried to gore someone years and years earlier that had behaved since then. And then someone borrowed the bull, even though the owner said, you don't want to borrow that bull. And they mistreated the bull and then the bull gored someone to death. Well, in that case, the judge could decide the death penalty wasn't appropriate. So it's giving judges the freedom to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, the family could decide, mm, we, don't want, we don't want the owner killed, we want money. And that was okay. It was a way to at least acknowledge that the family had suffered such a great loss. Um... Same principles applied in the death of a child. And again, boys and girls, they were all treated um, with respect. Um, but then we end with servants again and notice again, female or male. Now if they're gored, the master of the servant receives 30 shekels, which was considered the cost of a slave. You remember who also sold for 30 shekels, which is about 12 ounces? Jesus. It's so is sold for the price of a slave. Now more ox stuff. Verse 33 through 36 says, When a man opens a pit, or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to his owner, and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and share his price. And the dead beast also they shall share. Or if it is known that the ox has had been accustomed to gore in the past, and the owner has not kept it in, he shall repay ox for ox, and the dead beast shall be his. So, um... Owners of animals didn't want their animals going into other people's property. It's just not something they did. Um, so, But they could wander off. And yes, they could wander into someone else's yard. And yes, maybe that other person has a pit. Um, which was a dangerous thing to leave open. But um, the owner of the wandering animal, animal had some responsibility to keep it from wandering off. Um, and the compensation here doesn't involve killing any person, but um, if, if the animal died, then you sold the dead animal and um, gave the money to the owner. But the person that, um, well, and you gave him the beast, and yeah, then he could have steaks. It had to be investigated by a judge, and the judge, again, was looking for intent and negligence. So next, an ox who killed another ox. Um, the ox that did the killing didn't have to be killed, but the dead ox had to be replaced. Um, so 
to these struggling Israelite farmers, the death of an ox could mean the difference between life and death. That's what they used to plow their fields, to get grain to survive on. Um, so God's principle here is that we are responsible. If, if something happens that involves something we own, we need to pay for it. Now to Exodus 22. Verse 1 says, If a man steals an ox or sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for one ox and four sheep for a sheep. So this is obviously goes along with thou shalt not steal. And again, it's giving specifics so judges can know how to rule um, and that they would rule equally. So if you slaughter or sell an animal that's not yours, to the judges, it meant you meant to steal that animal at deliberate intent to steal. So if you stole, and they would have different, um, like if you stole a chicken, it might be one chicken, but um, for an ox, again, an important animal, sheep, important animals. So they knew if you, if you stole an ox, you had to pay back five oxen, which is a lot. And um, as someone pointed out, people probably didn't have a bunch of oxen. So what happened if you couldn't pay? You became an indentured servant for six full years, beginning of the seventh year, you're let out. So that's the one time where you are not selling yourself into slavery directly. You are because you stole, knowing you couldn't repay back. Verse 2 through 4, if a thief is found breaking in and is stuck so that he dies, or struck that, so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he will be sold for his theft. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. So property owners had a right to protect their property within a certain reasonable force. Breaking into someone's house at night, um, it was dark, they didn't have flashlights. Um, it would not be easy to identify who the person is that's breaking in. Um, so it was, if the owner, homeowner strikes the guy and he dies, that's it. Now, if it's daytime, they figured you'd be able to identify him. Um, and you would be able to subdue him without killing him, without lethal, lethal force. Now, if the thief is later caught. If he gets away and he's caught with an animal, he had to give the animal back and pay a fine of another animal. And if he couldn't, Again, he went into indentured servanthood. So again, if these laws are enforced, they're a real deterrent to doing these things. You'd have to be really desperate. Verse five through five and six. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. So you had to keep your animals out of other people's fields. You couldn't let them um, graze other people's fields. And no intelligent farmer would just walk, let his animals wander around like that. Um, you were responsible to for keeping your animals under control. If it was found that your animals or you in some way um, grazed someone's field so that it was, it was a substantial amount, um, you had to give up the best of your own field. Um, this is about carelessness and how we can be guilty 
by not taking care of things correctly. Um, for us, it means we have to have um, the proper concern for our property and the property of others today. Um, for instance, if we accidentally back into the car of someone else, hopefully we don't purposely do that, but if we accidentally do it, we need to leave a note and make good the damage. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to have the proper insurance to carry so that if something happens, we can take care of our responsibilities that way. Verse 7 and 8 say, If a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe, and it is stolen from a man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. Um, you know what? Oh, okay. I want to make sure I don't go too far. Um, so, it's, this is a situation where you've given something to your neighbor for safekeeping and it isn't, doesn't end up being safe. If someone breaks into their house and um, steals it. So a judge gets involved and determines if um, who's at fault here. Did it, you know, um, do they have responsibility? Who has the responsibility for paying it back? Um, a thief definitely has to pay double and if again if he can't pay it indenture servanthood um if no thief is found they have to go before the judge and um, the person that was given the money to hold on to he has to convince the judge that he didn't steal the money verse 9 for every breach of trust whether it is for an ox for a donkey for a sheep for a cloak or for any kind of lost thing, of which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. So in Israel, there was no finders keepers. Um, you could be walking down the street and you say, hey, that guy has my cloak. I, I lost my cloak a, a while ago. Even if the man innocently picked it up, um, if he was a good, honest person, he would say, I, I just found it in the field, but here, I know it's yours. I'll give it back to you. But if he says, no, this is my coat, they would go before a judge and a judge would decide. And whichever party lost, um, the one accusing, saying that's my coat, or the one saying, no, it's my coat, you know, I, I've had it, whoever loses has to pay double. There was a price for false accusations and um, frivolous lawsuits. No, they didn't do this. Okay, verse 10 through 13 say, If a man gives his to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any other beast to keep it safe, and it dies and or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by the Lord shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn by beasts, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn. So this covers when you are lending an animal to some. When and something suspicious happens, the animal dies or is hurt or driven away, and there are no witnesses. Now, again, if they both have the proper fear of God, both the parties are going to say, admit to what is going on in the, in the dispute. But the owner of the animal was to take and accept the sworn testimony of his neighbor unless there was conflicting evidence. And then it, that would be over. Um, it was the idea of innocent until proven guilty. So, 
if it came to where the animal was killed, just showing the carcass of the animal um, would show that he couldn't prevent the kill, but he did prevent the animal from being eaten. Um, kind of the concept of Joseph and his coat, his brothers produced the coat and said, we couldn't save Joseph, but we saved the coat. Um, and in this case, even though the owner of the animal suffered loss, he wasn't allowed to get any compensation because no one was at fault. If the animal had been in his possession and it had been um, eaten, you know, attacked by animals, he wouldn't get restitution there either. Verse 14 and 15. If a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it shall make full restitution. If the owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it was hired, it came for its hiring fee. So this is a case of when you're renting an animal from someone else, which they would do for um, sire and other animals pretty frequently. Or if you, if your neighbor couldn't afford an ox, you might rent your ox. It, this is about the responsibility of borrowing and lending. So the assumption was that if the owner was with the animal, like if you brought your ox over to mate with a cow and you stayed, um, if something happened to your ox, you're responsible, you were there. But if the owner wasn't there, the borrower is responsible. And the guilty party had to make good. So for us, what it means is when someone puts possessions into our hands and it's there, theirs, we're to take care of it. So basically this chapter and, mo and quite a bit of the last chapter was about restitution. So next week, what we're going to start on is we're going to talk about how these are all tied together with the Italian law. So that is it for this week. And again, I apologize for not remembering to get that camera going this morning. So again, you missed some great conversation, but I promise I will try to do better. So we'll see you all later.